So the more tools you can have in your toolbox to be a good communicator, a good salesperson, a good designer to pitch yourself, the more you're going to set yourself up from other people. Business of Architecture, episode 188. Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture firm income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today, you're going to have the excellent opportunity to hear from John Livesey. He's a top sales expert and funding strategist. He hosts the Successful Pitch Podcast with investors from around the world. And in addition to that, he's also the author of a book that recently came out, The Successful Pitch, Conversations on Going from Invisible to Investable. If you've ever struggled on how to present yourself in a way that's compelling, on how to influence and persuade people, on how to encourage the right people to like and to trust you, then you're going to find this episode to be absolutely invaluable. In this episode, you'll discover three things you can do to increase your confidence, the true secret that lies behind all successful persuasion, and how to become an incredible storyteller that lets your stories work for you. So with that... Here's today's show. All right, John, welcome to Business of Architecture. Enoch, thank you so much for having me on your wonderful show. Right, right. Well, so you're, you're known as the Pitch Whisperer, and would you describe to your audience why, why people call you that? Sure. Actually, Inc. Magazine called that me that first, which I'm thrilled with. And the main reason they said is, you know what? You really remind us of what a horse whisperer does, which a horse whisperer calms the horse down, and you calm people down before they go pitch and people get nervous when they have to present in front of people. Um, so that was sort of the first thing that they went, Oh, you're like a pitch whisperer. And I said, well, what's really interesting is in addition to that, there's a lot of subconscious unspoken things that I really help people answer when they're pitching and people have three things in their head that they think about when anybody pitches them anything to get a customer, to get their startup funded, no matter what you're doing to get, someone to join your team and those three things are the first thing is do I trust you which is really a gut thing and actually you know that's when the fight or flight response typically kicks in when people meet you for the first time right Uh, and the handshake was originally designed to show that you didn't need to fear me I don't have a weapon in my hand so you can trust me and then it moves up to the heart which is do I like you And of course, the best way to increase your likability is to show empathy, literally put yourself in the other person's shoes. Tim Sanders wrote a great book about that called The Likability Factor, that doctors spend more time with patients they like, teachers spend more time with students they like, and believe me, clients spend more time with um, people they like. In fact, I was working with Gensler, who designs airports, and the people in that department said to me, you know, we can all design airports. And the client told us that one of the key factors, because the job takes five years, is going to be on who do we like the most. So those soft skills are just as important as the hard skills of design. And then finally, once we move from the gut to the heart, it goes to the head. And that's where people start thinking, will this work for me? Is this something that I'm going to get a good return on my investment? Are they going to make me look good? All that stuff kicks in. But I've really flipped the paradigm because a lot of people think, well, you people have to know, like, and trust you before they hire you. And I said, no, it's the reverse. They have to trust, like, and know you. So that's why I've been called the pitch whisperer. So define for our audience pitch. Sure. A pitch is just another way of saying selling yourself, basically. Um, You know, in the design world, typically a law firm, for example, in – any country in the world these days, uh, big law firms are global, like uh, a lot of the law, uh, design firms, is they will invite two or three design firms to come in and, quote, pitch or present or sell or whatever you want to call it. But uh, in the startup world where I specialize, um, it's called a pitch. You know, give me a 10-minute pitch on why we should invest in your startup. And so that concept of pitching is the new way of saying, you know what? What's your elevator pitch, right? It's all the same thing. Get, tell, me, tell me who you are and what you do in the length of an elevator ride. So it's important that we all learn how to feel comfortable with pitching ourselves and 
telling people who, who we help and what problem we solve in a very short amount of time. You mentioned that a lot of times people, people feel understandably nervous going into mm. a situation where they're you know, feeling like they're having to promote themselves or selling. What are right. some of the inhibitions you find in your clients or people that you work with that's holding them back from giving a good, you know, representing themselves well? Well, the biggest inhibition that I see when people have to pitch themselves is they don't want to be a pushy salesperson. And I tell them, forget selling, tell stories instead. They're like, oh, I literally Plato said storytellers rule the world. So if I can help people become a storyteller and pull people in instead of pushing their message in, then they go, ah, oh, all right. Well, I'm really not confident being a storyteller and I'm certainly not confident getting up in front of people. So I said, all right, well, let's work on the confidence first and then the storytelling skills second. So should we do a deep dive on some tips on how to improve your confidence? Let's do it. Okay. The first thing is, you know, we all get butterflies in our stomach when we have to do something that makes us a little uncomfortable. And I tell people, don't get rid of the butterflies in your stomach. Instead, get them to fly in formation, which literally means get that nervous energy from your stomach, which is just adrenaline, out, make a gesture. And the it's just your body's way of saying, oh, game on. This is my Olympic moment. This is my Super Bowl of meetings. There's a lot at stake here. So the best way to increase your confidence is to prepare. Arthur Ashe said, the key to success is confidence and the key to confidence is preparation. So a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to practice. I'll just wing it. And I'm like, okay, well, what is that going to sound like? Well, it's a bunch of ums and ahs. So I said, you know what? The reason you're so nervous is you haven't practiced. You think athletes go on the field without practicing? You think... Uh, actors don't rehearse before the camera says roll an action it's the same thing so you need to practice and some people are afraid of sounding robotic and I said it's not to the point where you memorize something and you become a robot you are still yourself so the real way to do that is just make sure you have a very strong opening and a very strong close in any kind of pitch so at least you know what you're going to open with and close with and then you can be a little more relaxed about what's going to happen in between so getting those butterflies to fly in formation, preparing, and the third way to really soar with your confidence is something I call stacking your moments of certainty. And what that simply means is you write down four or five times when you knew you nailed it. So let's say you interviewed for a job and for someone to hire you for your design skills and you got it, right? So remember all those times when you got a yes before you go in to pitch your next client, as opposed to all the negative self-talk, which would be, oh, well, they're never going to hire me, I'm too expensive for them, whatever else it could, you know, make you feel like you're not going to get it. Do the opposite. Put, remember all the times you got a yes before you walk in. You, so you're prepared, you got your adrenaline working for you, not against you and stack those moments of certainty. So three key ways to really separate yourself from most people who won't do any of those things. If you do all three, I promise your confidence is going to go up. Okay, so the three key ways to increase your confidence. Thanks for sharing that, John. That is fantastic. And I, I want to go back to this. Let's talk a little bit. Let's keep on talking about confidence, but let's jump back to storytelling as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Can you give me some, some stories or some anecdotes of <laughs> times when stories have paid off for your clients or people you're working with? Yes. How does that work in reality? In reality, well, let's let's go back to the segue, a nice transition from confidence to storytelling. I have my clients all write down their moments of certainty, and we look at them to see which ones are the best and then what that feels like. So it's a story in their head that triggers a feeling. One of my clients, Martin, said, this was really powerful for me because I remembered that I grew up in the Netherlands, but I'm originally from South America. And when he turned 18, his parents took him back to South America, dropped him off naked in the Amazon jungle to survive for two weeks because in his culture, that's the rite of passage into manhood. I said, wow, that's a great story. That's memorable. That gives me goosebumps. What did you learn in the Amazon jungle? He said, well, I learned how to focus and pivot and persevere. I said, fantastic. We're going to take those lessons from the Amazon jungle to the concrete jungle of being an entrepreneur. And when he had that practice in home, he won a pitch contest and got his startup funded because the investor said, I'm going to put my money on the guy that survived the Amazon jungle. He'll be able to survive anything that comes up in his business. So that's a really great example of people remembering your stories, not your numbers. And 
the elements of a good story. So let's break that down. A good story has four basic elements to it. The first one is exposition. Who, what, where, when. With the story of Martin, sometimes when he was practicing, he would forget to say that being dropped off naked is right of passage in his culture. I said, if you don't say the rite of passage in your culture, it sounds like child abuse. <laughs> so you need enough exposition to make it paint a picture. Literally, you want to paint a picture for somebody. What time of day is it? Why are we here? Get them to be in the story, right? Then there's a problem to solve. That's the second part of a good story. There's an obstacle. There's a challenge. Um, you know, it's the hero's journey, basically. And if you're telling a story about yourself, it's your of challenges that you faced. So Martin is obviously naked in the Amazon jungle. The solution was he figured out three things to survive that became life lessons. And then the outcome was that it's what made him win a pitch contest and get a startup funded. So exposition, problem, something to overcome. There's a solution after you overcome those. And then the resolution of what happens after you've made that happen. So that's the basics of a good story and how it relates to tying in with your moments of certainty. John, do you have any suggestions for people that struggle to tell stories? You've probably experienced some or maybe you know, I've been that way in the mm -hmm. past where you try telling a story and you can already tell everyone sort of their eyes are kind of drooping because uh, you yes. have this monotone and it falls flat. You know, uh, yes. Do you have suggestions for people that may have an incredible story like that but just in the delivery of it, they, they don't mm -hmm. pause at the right moment, they don't deliver the punchline right and it just doesn't work mm -hmm. out. What, what tactical suggestions would you give someone for telling a good story? Well, telling a good story definitely requires practice and preparation, just like anything else. So you need to tell, practice it in front of your friends, practice it in front of strangers and get their feedback. And they'll say, oh, I was with you up until this point. Then you confused me or I, I lost you. I didn't understand what you're saying here. So the confused mind always says no. So you have to be really clear, concise and compelling and have that as your intention. Um, let me give you an example of how I um, helped Gensler when they have to pitch, they everybody talks about you know who's on their team, right? And let me tell you, whether you're a startup seeking funding or a big architecture firm or a small architecture design firm, people buy people first. So you need to have a story about yourself overcoming these objections and challenges. I call it the story of origin. What motivated you to become an architect or a designer in the first place? So one person said, well, I used to play with Legos when I was a kid, and now I'm an architect. I play, I'm still passionate about it. I play Legos with my son. So that's how he talks about his personal passion for design. And people go, hmm, I like that guy. Somebody else on the team said, oh, well, I was in the Israeli army. So I take the discipline and focus from being in that experience to keeping your project on time and under budget. Mm, that sounds great. That's interesting. So the more you give these stories of yourself, that they're just 90 second stories of this is who I am. This is why I'm doing this that make it a memorable hook. Then they go, I'm going to work with that. That's the team I want to work with. What other, what are things did you find that questions that came up? And I have a quote here on my screen. Uh, you did have the opportunity to be the keynote speaker at Gensler's yes. regional meeting in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And here's what, here's what uh, Kenneth Baker said. He's the co-regional managing principal with Gensler. He'll be on the show uh, soon. Here's what he said. and I'm going to read this for our listeners. Uh, he said, John did an incredible preparation to understand the Gensler culture and challenges that we face to stay at the top of our field. He gave us specific tools and focus on how to be storytellers so our clients not only see the value in hiring us, but are inspired to want to work with us. I highly recommend him as a speaker, and we look forward to having him back. All right, so it looks like, you know, Kenneth as well was kind of honing in on the idea of the storytelling. Yes, because as I mentioned earlier, people remember your stories, not your numbers. And people buy emotionally and then back it up with logic. And the big challenge is people think, well, they're going to... I show you my beautiful designs, you're going to hire me based on that. And then it just becomes a contest on who's got the prettier designs or who's the cheapest and all that other stuff. And I said, if you really don't want to be seen as a commodity, you need to be a storyteller that tells a story of a similar client that had a similar challenge, whether it's moving offices or trying to redesign the space to stay more 
compelling. We get into the stories of, if you're a law firm, for example, you want your office lobby in particular to have a wow factor. And so that's going to attract the best talent. That's going to attract the best clients. And you tell stories around that. So if you're pitching a new law firm and you've done other law firms, you say, you know what, when we went to XYZ law firm and we took them from a dark space to opening it up with lots of light, when we gave the tour to the employees, one of them, actually their eyes filled up with tears because they were so grateful they were no longer going to have to work without sunlight anymore. And so that's how you get people to be more productive and attract top talent. And then uh, we you know, had a new client come and decide whether they're going to hire us or someone else. And they kept saying, God, it just feels so modern and, and sophisticated here. And that's what we're looking for in our brand. And that's who we want to represent us as a lawyer. So instantly it says, so those are the stories that make people want to hire you because you have that same feeling that people buy emotionally from the right side of our brain and then back it up with the logic. All right, I like you, I trust you. You've told me a story of someone who had a similar challenge and how you overcame those challenges and still got them happy. I want that feeling. Now let's talk about the left side of the brain stuff, which is how much is this gonna cost? What's the square footage, blah, blah, blah. But you don't start with that. Is that helpful? Absolutely. Uh, when you're When you're coaching people about how to tell stories, what do you say to people that say, you know, John, I don't have... I don't have any stories like that. Mm, well, not all of us had to survive the Amazon jungle, that's for sure. However, there's always a story, and I love helping people find their own personal story of what motivated them to become a designer or uh, an, you know, an architect, and a story that they have inside their brain of a client that was struggling and was overwhelmed and how they helped them through that process, because that's really a great story. So many people are afraid of, okay, I know you can do good work, I can afford you, but are you gonna have my back? And you, so that's what we dig for. We my, we dig around in the, and I just have people write down and tell me stories, and when I hear it, I know it. And when that happens, they feel happy because they're like, oh, now I'm confident, because I have a story that's gonna really separate me from all the other competitors, and that that's gonna make me memorable, and people are emotionally gonna connect with me, they're gonna like me, and people hire people that they trust, like, and know, and now they're gonna know me more. So you come up with a story of when you didn't give up, um, when you you know had something unexpected happen and you still were able to get that project done on time, or you have a story of when you went the extra mile for a client. Anybody who's been in business at all has those stories. And you know, if you don't, then we start looking at families. We all have stories about our families, right? What I learned from my mom, or what I learned from my dad, or how I survived the holidays with my family is the same way I survived dealing with difficult people, right? Whatever it is that you, you, there's plenty of places you can talk about a trip you took. For example, I talk about one of my goals was to take um, a trip to Alaska and be on a glacier pulled by dog sleds. That was a, I just, that sounded like an incredible adventure to me and I really wanted to do it. So I booked a cruise to Alaska and had it all set up and then the weather was so bad they couldn't pull the ship close enough to shore to do it. So five years later I booked another cruise and by the time I wanted to uh, make that happen, um, they said, oh, it's sold out. I said, is there a waiting list? Yes, okay, morning of, boom, congrats, you made the waiting list. Oh, thank God, all right. So we get there, take the um, little tender to the shore, we take a bus to the helicopter, the helicopter takes you up and the guy goes, God, you guys are so lucky, yesterday it was so foggy, we couldn't land on the glacier. And I thought to myself, wow, it's such a small percentage of people who get to go to Alaska, smaller percentage of the people who are on the cruise that get to do this experience, and then you land there, and it's like you're on another planet, because those people are there with 150 dogs, they are there for weeks at a time with no internet, they sleep there with the dogs, and they have a big American flag stuck in the snow, you're completely surrounded by a glacier, it's unbelievable, it was exhilarating, it was everything I wanted and hoped, but that's, I tell the story of how much I had to want it to get it. And that tells the story of how I don't give up. And I like to have new exciting adventures. So people are like, hey, you're gonna be an interesting person to hang around with, right? 
So that's a really, you know, that has nothing to do with business, but that tells a story about me and my personality that people either resonate with or don't. So does that help as another resource of a place to come up with a story? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's there was a funny. Speaking of stories, there was a funny story that I heard once about a an architecture professional. I think he was a principal of a firm, and he mm-hmm. was the kind of glad handing guy who people loved him because he always had wonderful stories. He always told amazing jokes, and everyone thought, "Man, this guy's just a real people person, right?" So one day, one of his one of his associates was just looking through his desk for something and found a little box full of cards and he opened up the box and inside that box were all of the jokes uh, and the stories that he liked to tell yes. you know and awesome. and and yeah and when the when the principal heard about this he was pretty upset that the guy had, had found that because apparently he wanted to keep this thing a secret mm. uh, but what what I learned from that is that sometimes we look at others who are able to tell exceptional stories and we think, man, they just must have the gift and yeah, I don't have you're it. A natu- you're a natural. Yeah, it's what people say to me sometimes without having a clue how much coaching and practice I've had to get up and give a good keynote speech. I mean, Joan Rivers, was. they did a documentary on her and all the drawers and drawers of jokes that she kept. You know, it, it's, it's research. So you have that at your disposal. Uh, you know, Maslow said, if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, you tend to go around looking for nails to hit. So the more tools you can have in your toolbox to be a good communicator, a good salesperson, a good designer to pitch yourself, the more you're going to set yourself up from other people. Now, I can go into the different storytelling genres and give some examples. Would that be useful? Yeah, I think it would. Let's do it. Okay. So one genre is rags to riches, Right. So that's the classic Cinderella movie story. Yes. And so Johnny Walker Scotch uses that when they say, the oh, Johnny Walker was this poor Scottish farmer. Now he's Johnny Walker, right? Um, then another genre is um, Rebirth. Uh, remember the movie um, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart? Yeah, absolutely. So that's Love an it. example of that movie using the rebirth as a storytelling genre. And Prudential has taken that genre for their brand and says, you know, retirement is your rebirth. It's your third act. Isn't that interesting. Um, then another one is the quest, right? So Lord of the Rings is a great example of, of that kind of a movie that uses that. Lexus, their tagline is the pursuit of perfection. It's an endless quest. The fourth genre is um, leave home and then come back and tell about it. Well, that's the Wizard of Oz, isn't it? And you know who uses that in their advertising and branding? Expedia. Go leave home, have an adventure, book the trip on Expedia, and then come back and tell all your friends about it. So there's four genres, four movies, and four brands that are using that genre to position themselves. So as someone who is a designer, an architect, Figure out what genre you want to be and how you can take that genre to tell your story. So now you have storytelling and you've got the storytelling elements, the exposition, the problem solutions, right? So now you know how to tell a story and then you know you know can pick from four genres to tell a story. That's fantastic. And it works. I've seen, I mean, I'm sure our listeners listening now can think back to things that have been memorable in their lives, either from presentations or talks they've heard. Mm -hmm. And it truly is the stories that stick. So I want to go back to a story you told about perseverance and not giving up, Mm -hmm. John, because someone doesn't get to the point where you are, where you've obviously developed, uh, you've invested in yourself in crafting who you are as a person Mm -hmm. uh, without having some road bumps along the way. So what I'd like to know is, can you tell me about a time when you gave a pitch or you told a story or you were in some high pressure situation that you felt it fell flat and you perhaps, you know, you felt like a failure or whatever kind of emotions that you had about that and how you overcame it? How'd that go? Mm. <laughs> well, years ago when I was selling advertising for a magazine, um, I had a big presentation uh, in front of my publisher who had flown in from New York and we were at Nordstrom's in Seattle. And it was a Monday morning, so we had to fly in the night before, lots of preparation. And we walk into the meeting at nine in the morning on a Monday, and I've flown in from LA, and he's flown in from New York, and a person comes up and says, I'm sorry, the decision makers had an emergency, they're not gonna be able to see you. And so you're gonna have to meet with somebody junior. So my boss was furious. (laughs) 
and mad at me for not confirming. And I'm like, I confirmed it on Friday. Uh, you know, I can't, this is something out of my control. And he's like, well, just go through the presentation really fast because this whole thing's a waste of our time. And I was, oh, you know, so obviously that is not the best situation to have to go present, right? So I'm going through the presentation fairly quickly. Um, there's not a lot of passion because I'm thinking this person's just there out of courtesy. They don't have any power to say yes or no. And um, it was a really small room to make matters worse. No windows. You could, when you backed up the seat, it hit the wall. You get a sense of how tiny the space is. <laughs> and there really was, there was barely enough space between the projector uh, and the screen for it to be in, in focus. Right. So we're going through the slides. And um, so I go to the slide where we have a quote from another retailer saying how great the magazine is and why they advertise. And it was too small to read, but I thought it doesn't matter because, you know, we're just going through this. And he goes, oh, go back and um, read that quote. And I was like, I don't have that memorized. Normally I can read it when we're in a normal sized room. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe if I pull the, you know, the laptop up, I can pull, get this. Info. And of course, then it went on the ceiling. It was a disaster. So it just went from bad to worse. And um, then we leave that meeting. He goes, well, that couldn't have gone any worse, could it? And I go, no, nope, probably couldn't. Wrong person, wrong, bad presentation, wrong room, just everything was horrible. And I said, however, one of the things I've learned is that we got to shake this off for the next call. We can't take all that anger and resentment into the next meeting that we have in an hour or the whole day is going to go bad. So how can we set the reset button and let that go and focus on our next call and hope that this one goes better? So that was one of my big lessons of you, you just got to, you can't let that continue. Because otherwise you have a bad day, you have a bad week, you have a bad month, and on and on. <laughs> Unless you say, pull up like an airplane pilot, right? When you start to go down. So how did you set the reset button? Or what are some strategies that you use or recommend for doing that in your own life? Well, first I just, you know, literally go out with, like, let's take a little walk, get some fresh air, get some perspective, right? Uh, I don't care if we have to go get a coffee, whatever it is, right? And then let's start talking about some of the recent wins we've had. In fact, why don't we pick up the phone between now and the next call and call somebody who's a happy client and just say, check in with them to say hi. It's good customer service, but most importantly, it's going to help, uh, help us remember that we have a lot of clients that love what we do and what we offer. And that's a really great way to hit the reset button. That is awesome. John, I'm looking here and you won Salesperson of the Year for Condé Nast, which I assume was maybe that same publication you're talking about <laughs> yes. uh, across 400 other global salespeople. So you do have quite a bit of experience and background in, in selling and presenting yourself. What would you say were the keys to your, you know, from your perspective, what were your keys to success of winning the salesperson of the year for Condé Nast? Well, that particular story is really interesting. You know, there's 23 different brands. There's Arc Digest, there's Vanity Fair, Vogue, W, wow. GQ, Wired, et cetera, et cetera. So each of those brands have their own sales force. And every year, one person from those brands wins salesperson of the year for that brand, that magazine, which is now a website and a whole a bunch of other stuff that they've expanded to. Um, and then out of the 23 people that win for those brands, there's one person that wins for the entire company. So first I had to win for just W Magazine, and then I had to win against everybody else. So the story of how I did that was, again, it's all about preparation. I had approached Guest Jeans, which was a big advertiser I had um, at W Magazine. And I said, you know what I noticed is W's 40th anniversary is coming up the same year that Guest's 30th anniversary is coming up. What if, and that's a great takeaway for your listeners and people watching, great way to start a sentence, to get people into the right brain, the imagination, literally say, what if we were to do a joint anniversary celebration? Oh, what would that look like? Well, I've done a little bit of research and turns out that some of the guest models like Drew Barrymore have also been over on the cover of W Magazine over the years. What if we had an event where we put those pictures of Drew as your model and Drew as our cover girl next to each other and invited celebrities and you could polybag a special supplement showing 30 years of guest models to our anniversary issue? That would generate additional publicity and buzz for both you and W and that should be a great way to celebrate 
and re- get people to remember all the iconic models and all the iconic images from W. And they did it, and we got exclusive business and all kinds of publicity, and that's what made them give me Salesperson of the Year. That's fantastic. So it sounds like you saw a big lever, and you pulled mm-hmm. it. Yeah, so you have to think outside the box, as people like to say all the time. It's just really looking for those moments where it's a win for everybody and coming up with an idea that no one else has ever come up with. That's fantastic. Well, John, thank you for, you know, we've covered so much in this interview. We've talked about storytelling. We've talked about improving your confidence. That's been fantastic information. I I know this is something that our listeners are going to get a lot of value out of. And I look forward to jumping into our next segment. Me too. All right. Thanks, John. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect, get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. The sponsor for today's show is Arch Reach, the client relationship management tool built specifically for architects. If you want to systematize your marketing and business development, Arch Reach will help you do it. Visit archreach.com to learn more. expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.